No point in coming otherwise. An historic occasion, 31 years ago, was when England were last here, and Michael Atherton and Addy... I think we've shown so far in the first two tests that we can turn tough situations around. We're 60 for three at lunch on the first day of the first test, and we got to 380 or 370, whatever. <laughs> He's caught, brilliantly caught, by Craig Matthews. Always oh, caught, caught behind. I realised the importance of getting runs on that first day, really. 60 for three, we had to get to 300. Um, so I was sacrificing maybe a bit of fluency, um, shot making, um, just in the basic need of staying at the crease and, and finding runs. Just amazing the pace that this young man does generate. He's he is awkward, he gets close to the stumps, um, and his arm comes from behind his body. He's got a very high arm, which he tends to extract more bounce than maybe the other bowlers. And whilst he's not as quick as Alan Donald, um, sometimes you find his bounce are more awkward to face because you don't quite see it so early. Beautifully timed. It was actually a very good hundred, Graham Hicks, at Centurion, because, again, it comes under pressure. And what we've always worried about, I think what the spectator, what the punter, the pundit has always worried about, is whether or not Graham Hicks is going to produce hundreds at the right time, i.e. first innings are important, um, under pressure is important, and he had all that. that, that was always the case at Centurion. Wickets were down, if Graham Hicks had got out at Centurion just after lunch there, then England would have been in, in deep trouble. But he played a great knock, he looked composed, he picked the shots right, and I hope that, that the competence he should have got from these innings now is standing in good stead for, again, a long, long time to come. Too short. Jack has changed, we even got him out drinking a couple of times on this tour so far, so he seems a lot more relaxed about his cricket and I think he's got a, a lot more out of it because of that, he's become a, a better player because of, uh, maybe it's a few times he was a bit too intense and sort of if he played a bad shot or he had a bad day he would, he would, you wouldn't see him in the evening but now he seems a lot more relaxed about it and I think because of that he's, he's a lot better player. The scorecard for the day, England finishing on 381 for nine, a magnificent 141 from Graham Hick. And of course, Atherton was out for that resolute 78. This is my sixth floor for England, and in any tour before this, we've got in a position like we have been in, in Wanderers, even, even a better position, without a shot of a doubt, we'd have lost the game. But I've just seen a phenomenal innings by Michael Hudson. Andrew Hudson and Gary Kirsten opening the innings for South Africa. It was a 50-50 decision, we felt. The wicket was grassy and it was a bit damp. We'd had thunderstorms in Joburg the previous two days. And I also found the South African Weather Bureau on that morning and they said that thunder showers were imminent. Angus Fraser going round the wicket and that's an absolutely beautiful on drive. Gets his weight up so well does Gary Kirsten. I think it's always an advantage being a left-hander. <laughs> There's not many right-arm bowlers that enjoy bowling at left-handers and he put the bad balls away very well. Angus Fraser and he's got it away through. They're trying to close the gap on him there. In England two years ago, he made starts, got to 50, 60, got bogged down, got out. This time he went on, got his 100. It was his first Test 100, which is a big moment for everybody. And I thought he played more fluently than I've seen him play before. Oh. He's got it away again through that gap. And this is the long-awaited moment. He was beginning to worry whether he'd ever get there, but he's there now. Jonty Rhodes has gone. Again, the way swing of Dominic Cork. Dominic just developed, you know, and he's just a fantastic ball, as you see. He moved the ball, get consistent bounce, consistent carry, consistent pace, ball close to the wicket, and it's, it's, you know, it's not just a joke thing, he's just a phenomenal bowler. He's certainly the most penetrative bowler we've got. Um, 
I think confidence is a big factor. He obviously knows he's getting wickets. He feels like he's going to get wickets. So he's ultra confident. Um, he's, he's aggressive. Um, he's up front. He's at the batsman all the time. I think the batsmen feel intimidated when he bowls. And he's got a lot of uh, good things going for him. He gets close to the stumps. He swings the ball away. He's got a good bouncer. Uh, and when the ball's not swinging, he's always giving himself a chance of getting LBW decisions with his wicket to wicket bowling. So there's plenty going for him. Devon Malcolm and Pollock with early aggression. And more runs for young Pollock, and he really got hold of that one. It's up in the air. Robin Smith is out there. He's yeah, at one stage I was really down, you know. My family, the physio and all that, they helped me to get through it, or else Pop wouldn't be here talking to you. And it was nice to see, you know, come in the second test match, ball pretty well, took six weeks in the game. So I can only see it from now. Um, I'm just going to go from strength to strength. Oh, that's a peach from Devon Mac uh, Malcolm. Well, discussing the situation of the England attack with Jeff Boycott, he strongly believes that Malcolm should be a fixture in the England side, and this is one of the reasons why. That is a, an absolutely perfect delivery to a tail ender. Just does enough, hits the seam, leaves him. It would have beaten many a better batsman than Alan Donald. A complete South African scorecard, and 55 runs scored in this morning's play. Just 14 overs, thanks mainly to Sean Pollock's 33 from 45 deliveries. Hit five fours in that. Well, you look at people like Ambrose and Walsh, and to be honest, they're, 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 they're still a lot better bowler than he is because they more consistently at you and in the right areas. But no, Alan Donald is a magnificent bowler and is obviously a big threat to us in the last three test matches. He's bowled him! I think as bowlers go in the world today, he's probably as quick as anybody. He doesn't, he's not a big swinger of the ball or a big mover off the seam because the wickets here in South Africa are generally flat. So the batsman has got a chance, uh, but you have to make sure you're on your guard because uh, a moment's relaxation and you know he's quick enough to, to get through you any time. Bowled him, middle stump. Clive Eckstein, his first ball. And the finger's gone up. Merrick Prince. He's caught. He's caught at short mid-wicket by Gary Kirsten. Yeah! He's caught it. Caught and bowled. Straight back at the bowler. And Graham Hick goes, and now England are in desperate trouble. Pollock to Cork. Caught. Brilliantly caught by Daryl Cullinan at first slip. That's back to Macmillan, and that's the end of the England innings. That was a full toss, but I think he held it back a little bit. So all out for 200, a lead of 132 for South Africa. What an effort in the field by the South Africans. It's always a good sign with any sports and whatever the sport. He wants to be involved in virtually every minute of the game. He doesn't mind if the captain says, carry on bowling forever. He'll take part as, as whatever you ask him to do, he'll do. Some people are falsely aggressive where it can harm their game, but he's, he's not that way at all. He's, he, he likes being that way and it helps his game. It helps him to be competitive and aggressive and in your face, so to speak. He's, he's good like that. He's a big player, I suppose, if not the best, he's one of the best all-rounders in the world at the moment. He's batting, I'd say, their, most, their best batsman. He, I bowled a lot of it, a lot at him in the second innings. And he's very well organised, he knows where his stumps are, and he, he plays to his limit, well, not limitations, but he plays to his game. He waits for you to bowl in the right areas, and for him, and if you bowl a bad ball, then he hits it for four.
I was short runs going into that innings. Um, I didn't get any runs at Bloemfontein against the Orange Free State. and didn't get any in the first innings of the Test match, so I was probably short of form. Um, but funnily enough, straight away batting in the second innings, I felt in good order. I felt the feet were moving and I was seeing the ball well. Um, and just sometimes the lift of a Test match, the adrenaline flowing, can give you that, that extra edge you need. It's simply one of the best innings you'll ever see from any batsman, captain or otherwise. I think it actually helped Michael Ellison because, because he was captain, because it gives you that added incentive to do the right things, to, to actually fight that bit harder. Mark Ramprakash is not a novice. It is a difficult one if he's played 20 tests now, which is about the same number as Graham Thorpe. It is a difficult one in that it's the most, well, a difficult position to bat in the order. Um, but what we've felt in the past is that too often we've sacrificed our best players um, to get a, a young player in, in, in his best position. And what we're trying to do now is that we feel we've got five players who are experienced and successful test match batsmen. And we're trying to get those in their best positions. Oh, over the head of second slip and four lucky runs. 99, the England captain, twice he's been out on that score in the past. They dropped him! Uh, so we in terms of the team's needs, and that on this occasion, and, and we need to back time rather than just get runs for a first on milestone. Whilst it's nice to pick up hundreds, um, that, the shot which I was dropped on 99 was in no way affected by the kind of nerves of the 90s. Four runs, that's the hundred. And fit up when you've got a milestone, you've reached a milestone, you can let a release of energy, a release of emotion, um, and that's a good thing. Um, but at, at that stage, with a new ball, I was finding it tough to, to both psych myself up and keep in control, and that probably explains why, why I was quite emotional at, at that moment. Nuggety, gritty Jack Russell to the wicket. He gets a lot of stick, Jack, for not being the prettiest batter in the world, but uh, he's bloody effective. And, uh, I know I'd, if I had to have two men batting for my, for my life, I wouldn't choose any others than Athers and Jack. It didn't matter to him one little bit whether or not he scored runs. I know he apologised afterwards to the TV crews for not being entertaining, but it didn't matter because the battle was such a good one. Well, he was constantly reminding me of Bridgetown in 1990 when England lost the last wicket with 12 minutes to go of the Test match, and he'd been through that. He was the central character on that day, and he didn't want to go through it again. So he, more than anybody, was the, was the one who, who kept me going. I didn't think we were going to do it, to be honest. I mean, you sit there all day, and the longer it goes on, the worse it gets, because the sort of more crucial your, your innings, when it happens, is going to be. I wouldn't say you're superstitious, but you sort of sit in an area or sit in a spot, and if you don't lose wickets and things go well, you just stay there. And, and I sat in the same spot with Corky, in the same spot, who was next to him to bat for four, four hours or so. 163 to win England. That is not in their minds, it's to hold out. South Africa becoming increasingly frustrated. Jack Russell's is unique, I mean, it's a battling style, it's what it sounds like, it's a terrier at the crease. But it was nonetheless a very, very effective innings, because without that, I think Michael would have run out of support and England could still have lost the game. If England were in that position where um, we got to bowl South Africa out in a, a day and a bit, and we didn't do that, I will be devastated. You got a shot off the door, I'll feel terrible. We obviously had a, a match to save um, and to bat that length of time against that attack on a wicket, which whilst was a good wicket, still had plenty of pace and bounce. Um, it, it was a kind of satisfying moment, yeah. We talked this morning about the need to sharpen up our act a little bit before the next test. And Although we got out of jail and we got away with the draw, we didn't play very well during the second test. We realised that and we realised the need to, to improve in certain areas. Well, England ground out an almost impossible looking draw at the Wanderers thanks to that marathon innings, 185 not out from Michael Atherton and the wonderful 29 not out, four hours of dogged resistance from Jack Russell. As a result, they went to Durban with something of a psychological advantage. Nevertheless, there were some very surprising team changes. I think the way they select the side is, is how they see the wicket and how they think it's going to play, uh, if the ball's going to swing. And they thought the ball would swing a lot, so they... Uh, uh, took out Devon uh, and uh, Angus uh, um, and put in um, Peter Martin and, and Mark Eilat and in the end turned out to be a good selection. I thought we gave them a bit of a start, we gave them a bit of a flyer, 50 runs in the first hour um, and after that I was really pleased with the way they bowled. Peter Martin in particular bowled impressively. Mark Eilat got the ball to swing on the second morning and we knocked them over. Yeah, it was a little bit more overcast, uh, it's very humid in Durban but it wasn't the first day, more in the second day. 
uh, which helped the ball to, to swing a little bit more. Uh, Peter Martin and Mark Islet bowled very well uh, to get rid of the tail. At 153 for nine, England were bang on top until the coming together of Sean Pollock with last man Alan Donald, and they put on 72 for the last wicket. Alan Donald, you know, he can bat. You do really want to get rid of him as quickly as possible, but unfortunately they put on 50, which does happen, uh, and got themselves into quite a respectable score from the position they were in. Well, England were now rattled, and then some high-class fast bowling put South Africa right back into the driving seat. Alan Donald from the old Fort Road end. He's caught! He's brilliantly caught! He's caught! He's caught by Cullinan in the slips. Yeah, they bowled very well, they bowled very straight, uh, bowled very lively. Alan Donald and Sean Pollock on his home ground, and got us into trouble. I think 150 for five, we finished. Um, still felt we were perhaps in control if, if Dominic Cork and Graham Hick could have got a stand together, but um, really the batting was a bit iffy, it was a bit frenetic, too many loose shots. The match was intriguingly poised, but then for the second time in three tests, the weather decided the result. Unrelenting rain meant three frustrating days in the dressing room for the players and the match was abandoned. There was a wicket that really suited me. I was enjoying bowling there. Um, the conditions were, were good to bowl in, so it was very frustrating to sit off the field um, with a three for, uh, to sit off the field for three days, yeah. Well, instead of Port Elizabeth for the fourth test match, where following the rain sodden game at Durban, the weather forecast was different. It was for sunshine and clear blue skies. England made one change, bringing in Galleon for the unfortunate John Crawley, and finally that 18-year-old uh, spinning sensation, Paul Adams, he was brought into the South African side. It was a plum batting track for the first two days. That was when the wicket was at its absolute best, and it would have been nice to win the toss and, um, and set the South Africans a daunting target rather than chase the game. They put on good partnerships all the way through. Um, getting them for 80 for three on there, you know, you think you've got a chance of bowling them out quite cheaply. Uh, but unfortunately every partnership that kept going in we couldn't break it soon enough and they got themselves to a very good score of uh, 400. I thought we bowled reasonably well. Um, as I say it was a plum pitch, it wasn't the type of pitch where you're going to run through a batting side. Um, nobody got away from us, nobody got 100. The scoring rate was kept between two and two and a half. I thought it was a reasonable bowling performance. The disappointing thing from our point of view is that nobody got 100 really and if somebody got 100 in that position you possibly maybe get 460 and you get it maybe a half an hour earlier, um, which makes the game go forward that much more. Um, so that was a bit disappointing, but to get to 428 was a good performance after, as you say, being 89 for three. We said anything in excess of 350, um, close to 400, and uh, all the guys just kept chipping in. You know, Dave Richardson played superbly again, and uh, you know, I think we were very happy. I don't think 500 it might have just taken us a bit long because, it, like I said, the English bowling is very disciplined. And in order to score 500, you, you've got to be scoring that at, at three and over, I think, um, in order to, for it to work. Otherwise, you're just taking up too much time at the crease. In reply, England faltered at first, but again, Mike Atherton stood firm. And as at Pretoria, he found an able ally in Graham Hick. Short. And this time, safely done by Atherton. And that is a glorious cover drive. Everything right. It was a very good knock by others again. He seems to set up the innings very well if he stays there. Um, fortunately, I think he was given out probably a lot wrongly looking at the, the television replays. We got to 150 for three and then obviously lost a couple of wickets around that stage, which was a vital time for us. Um, once again, one or two poor shots, but a, a little bit more um, solidity about our batting um, than at Durban. Well, 163 for three had suddenly become 200 for seven, and it was backs to the wall again. But Russell and Illingworth, they batted defiantly to avoid the follow-on. Jack, again, has been the revelation of this tour all the way through. He's, he's batted with guts and, and conviction and you know, wanted to set his, his stall out of, of not getting out, and he's done it. I came out with a bit of a mission. Um, obviously, you have to, have to play as an all-rounder now. The, whoever keeps working for England has got to score runs as well. So I've been working uh, hard at both sides of my game and uh, I'm enjoying my cricket. Jack nearly saw us through a crucial stage that night where we avoided the follow-on and was, although they didn't crack on the next morning, um, it certainly gave our bowlers an opportunity to get amongst the South African batsmen. I think we just said to ourselves, come on, you know, it's the fourth test, uh, there's one to go here. You know, we don't want to go one down, let's just try and give it all. And you know, It was a great opening spell by Peter Martin to bowl seven over seven maidens, two for none. Uh, just set us up a little bit. Uh, 
and we just said, come on, let's let's just get stuck in. One bowl is short. Let's make sure we just go out there and show people, you know, we're not a sort of side who sit down and let people walk all over us. I think when you got a deficit of 140, 150, it would have been very easy to come out defensively. Uh, but we stress the need to get wickets early on. We got two early wickets, and that's certainly the best way of of getting back into the game and slowing the scoring rate at the same time. And at 69 for six, we were in with a sniff of victory. I think throughout the series, Cork's been first class. I mean, he's done a lot of bowling. He's carried on running in. I mean, his performance in the fourth test was just very special bowling, sort of 20, 25 overs on the trot. Um, he's been comfortably the pick of the bowlers. He's gone. With a target of 328 in just over a day, there was a faint chance of an England victory. But would they go for it? We thought if we could get to T uh, with none down, probably needing about 150 or, or so in the last, last session, we'd probably have a think about it then. But uh, the main thing was not to lose wickets. Uh, a very good attack, and especially with Paul Adams, uh, he's a very unorthodox bowler and can run through sides you know, if, you, if you're not used to facing him. In fact, a slow track and defensive fields meant that despite losing only one wicket before tea, England never really went for victory. And although Stuart and Gallion both fell near the close of the match, that had long since become a very dour stalemate. Well, going into the final test at Newlands, there was every possibility, thanks to rain and Atherton's wonderful innings in Johannesburg, of a nil-nil draw. Now, that's something very rare in test cricket and something that really nobody could have predicted, least of all the South African team coach Bob Woolmer. Bob, at Newlands, all to play for. Um, you went for an extra batsman, England for an extra bowler. Yes, the reason we went uh, for the extra batsman is that uh, we felt that the Newlands wicket, being brand new, would just be a little bit uh, exciting in terms of uh, what it would do. Um, plus, we felt we had four strike bowlers in Donald, Pollock, Macmillan and, uh, and Hoho, um, who uh, we felt could bowl England out if it did something. At the team meeting the night before, we actually knew we were going to field first. I don't know why, it's just one of those things. I don't think we would have fielded if we'd won the toss, but it was just we just had that gut feel. And Alan Donald uh, made a comment to me, he said, if we do feel we've got to bowl him out for under 200, we've really got to try. And he was instrumental, he got five wickets, so he was determined uh, the night before. Earlier in the year, you got hold of some uh, England dismissal tapes from West Indies and Australia. Were they useful for you? They were in that um, we learned how some of the England batsmen get out and where to bolt in. Um, obviously, they're not the panacea of, of uh, all cricketing uh, knowledge, but I think the bottom line was we knew where people got out and it helped us to bowl in certain situations there. Bowled in, England all out. Well, a tremendous performance by South Africa. England having the advantage of winning what was a good toss to win and uh, from the outset they were in trouble. It was a funny situation because we really wanted to try and score 350, 400, and it didn't come about. England bowled magnificently after lunch, which was a crucial period. They kept us down to 36 runs in the two, two hours, and they put us under a, a lot of pressure, they, uh, particularly Martin bowled very well during that period, and uh, we weren't able to get away. Big edge, Martin has got Cullinan. Angus Fraser. Another nick, and uh, Rhodes has gone. And so South Africa lose two important wickets in the space of five balls and the whole complexion of the match changes again. Macmillan is going to have to hurry. Oh, brilliant fielding by Dominic Cork. Well, Dominic Cork, he says it's out. He's in no doubt. He's gone. He has to go. Martin to Callis. That's got to be, yeah, up goes the finger of umpire Dave Orchard and Jacques Cullis on his way. Some useful scores in the test matches. He's caught, superbly caught by Robin Smith at short leg. It looked at one stage if we were just about to going to get a 20-run lead, which wouldn't have been enough. Uh, thankfully, of course, uh, Dave Richardson comes in down the order and he's a fine batsman. And to our surprise, and, and obviously a uh, welcome surprise, um, young Paul Adams uh, really came to the good and uh, he scored, uh, batted well. You have to remember he opened the batting for Plumstead High School. <laughs> um, I suppose when uh, he handled the first sort of couple of uh, deliveries really well, then he hit that cover drive for four. And I think he then decided to be positive. And I think Dave Richardson and both of them decided that uh, it's better to be positive than to be sort of try and just hang around. And they went for the runs and uh, that was the difference in the match. We felt that on that wicket and the scoring rate as it was, it would take them 
uh, at least a session and a half. And if we could just get two, three or four wickets in, that, in those sessions, it would put them under a lot of pressure. And as it turned out, um, that happened. He's caught. Caught by Cullinan at first slip. A straightforward catch. Peel for a catch at the wicket. Umpire Orchard gives him out. And Adams has picked up another test wicket. Another one through the covers. Perfect timing. Fielder gives up the chase. Then we had a, a really good stand, uh, which Graham Hick orchestrated. And it took a fiery spell from uh, Sean Pollock to break it. There he goes again. And he struck this even better. It's a huge six. Two in a row off Adams. Pollock. <laughs> Big appeal for LBW. And Steve Randall of Australia puts the finger up. And that's the one the South Africans really needed. He got out in the same way in the first innings to Pollock, and there he goes again. Just away again. They're going to have to hurry here. There could be a run out. Direct hit by Hudson. Brilliant fielding. What does umpire Orchard say? I think he's said not out. He has not called for the third umpire to make a decision. Umpire Dave Orchard did eventually relent and has asked there's no bail being dislodged there other than by the ball batsman obviously way short so the right decision is out so a little controversy but what does have to be said is at the end of the day the correct decision was made whether it was done in the right way is a matter that will be discussed for a long time it's up in the air Adams is underneath and he's got it. And Newlands erupts. Not only because England are all out, but Adams has picked up his second catch. He's catching them, he's taking wickets. He made runs yesterday. It's all happening for the youngster. Pollock gets those five, his first five for, five for 32. By far his best bowling performance. I saw him uh, the Sri Lanka tour in the under 24s when I went with him. And he was, um, always going to be an outstanding cricketer and I think uh, if we're looking for a successor to Brian McMillan I think we found one already in a couple of years time. Scores level. There it is. Newlands comes to its feet. Bishop Tutu, Ali Bacher leap into the air as do all the rest of them and what a victory in the test match and in the test series.